So hopefully everybody's not too sleepy after lunch. All right, just by a show of hands, how many people um, have heard of Jupyter Notebooks? Great. Um, how many people use Jupyter Notebooks on a semi-regular basis? How many people use Jupyter Notebooks every day? OK, OK, so I guess I don't have to do the hard sell today. Everybody seems to be familiar with Jupyter Notebooks and uh, what it has to offer. But uh, nevertheless, um, let's, let's, let's get started. Yeah, um, I'm just uh, worried that it keeps going off and I put it back in my pocket, but let's try again. All right, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay, awesome. All right, let's go. Um, so today's presentation, which is about Jupyter Notebooks, is going to be done in Jupyter Notebooks as well. Um, so let's hope that works. All right, let's see. Um, let's go there. All right. OK, so Jupyter Notebooks. Hello. Um, I'm going to have to access my toolbar during the presentation. Um, if there's something specific, OK. All right. Um, all right. Hopefully, it's not too much of a hindrance. OK, um, Jupyter Notebooks, before we get to that, I've found out a little bit about you guys, so just a tad about me. Um, I'm a data scientist at Fearsome Engine. We primarily build, uh, uh, deal with natural language processing and chatbots. Um, my background's in physics, so not related to that at all. Um, Fearsome Engine is a startup within Precalc Consulting, so you can if you want to get in touch, email me at Harry at Precalc. Um, this is my first PyCon talk, so yay. Um, you can tweet at me at that handle, and I write on medium at Ari Ramkilau. OK, so what do I want to get from this talk? Um, can everybody see? OK, it's, I have a dark theme, unfortunately. I, it's just easier on my eyes when I'm working, but I didn't think about this. That's fine, all right. Um, ha, okay. This slide chooses not to show. This is what I want to um, achieve from this, from this talk. There's nobody really new to Jupiter, so um, I can already, already take one thing off my list. Um, I'm hoping that people here today who use Jupyter Notebooks will pick up at least one tip or trick because there are so many. Um, I hope that in our discussions during the question session and afterwards that maybe I can learn uh, a couple of tricks from, from you guys as well. All right. Um, I'm going to go through the notebook like this. So. I promised not to use the hard sell, but the slide's here, so I'm going to touch on it anyway. Um, typically, when we're exploring a new topic and we're trying to learn about it, a notebook would, have, would look something like this, right? We'd have writing, we'd have drawings, different colors, tables, and all in the same place. And f for a long time, this wasn't available to, to, to coders, to data scientists. Um, I mean, not for free at least, you, you could use Mathematica, but that yeah, cost you an arm and a leg. But Jupyter Notebooks um, and its predecessor, IPython, aim to address this by allowing you to incorporate text, code, um, rich, rich media, um, 
all in the same all in the same notebook in one in one place for you to to use um, yeah okay so Jupyter notebooks are the predecessor I mean are the uh, successor of IPython notebooks and the Jupyter the, it's they try to come up with an acronym where the J used for Julia Python and R but those are just three of the languages that are supported um, there are dozens of languages that can be used uh, and interchanged within a sing single notebook, which can be a hindrance and useful uh, depending on your on your application. Um, so let's keep going. Um, yeah, it's more than just a um, typical IDE. It allow allows you to play around with your code, text, uh, mathematics. Uh, mathematical notation plots all interactively and you can chop and change as much as you want and you know in a more seamless fashion uh, pretty great for rapid prototyping so um, yeah so instead of a blank page when you open up your IDE or a, um, a flashing cursor in your terminal you when you open up a Jupyter notebook you end up with um, an empty cell and a collection of cells make up a notebook. All right. Um, uh, as I mentioned, many things that can go in the notebooks. Um, I expected a few more novices here, so just a description of what exactly Jupyter Notebook is and how it works. The, the kernels under the hood is basically your compute engines and you can have many different versions of those so you there's a Julia R of Python ones on display but like I mentioned earlier there's ones for well there's you can have different versions of Python running within the same notebook if if necessary um, uh, Fortran for those who still use Fortran um, C and many others most of the languages I haven't even heard of before. All right, so that's basically what I was going through. Okay, I'm gonna try and go into slideshow uh, format again. Let's see if it works. All right, hide the input. And I'll touch on, on all uh, the items in the toolbar um, later in the presentation. Okay, so in there and that's what you get under the hood is that right I've, I've mentioned what a kernel is um, and notebook server the web socket is just what allows you to talk to your kernel via the um, via a web interface which you do not need to be connected to the internet for by the browser um, you don't have to be, but if you have your s notebooks on a the server, then obviously it's different. Uh, yeah, so why is Jupyter important as a data science tool? Or why do I like Jupyter so much? Um, a big focus of uh, data science, well, of Jupyter, or a big calling card is that it's central to democratizing data science and machine learning. Uh, the learning barrier is, you know, um, not as high anymore because concepts are able to be explained in more detail because you have different media in the same place, so it's easier for to to grasp concepts, um, and it's easy for rapid prototyping. And yeah, you don't have to have, you don't yeah. Uh, if you using Jupyter notebooks, it's much easier to come to terms with some of the um, technicalities. Um, the pedigree in Jupyter Notebooks, um, Netflix, who's, who we can imagine ha have a lot of data at their disposal, are using Jupyter Notebooks at the core of their, um, there's a core element in their data strategy. There's some good medium posts and talks at JupyterCon earlier this year by the guys at Netflix detailing how they 
uh, how central Jupiter looks uh, um, to their strategy. So, uh, yeah, the, if I mean it, that that goes to show how valuable and useful these notebooks these notebooks can be. Um, yeah, and Project Jupiter won the 2017 ACM Software System Award. Uh, and yeah, I've just listed a couple of other guys who have won the same award in previous years, just to show you what company Jupiter is keeping, because um, yeah, in the recent past, Jupiter has got some bad uh, publicity. So we can touch on that a bit later if you want. Yeah, and it's obviously widely used. If it's widely used, it's widely supported, and in a field that's moving as fast as data science, you don't want to be stuck with tools that lose uh, support. You want to be able to, you know, not have those sort of things hinder your progress. And using Jupyter is, yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a tool worth using. Um, a new concept called, a relatively new concept called dynamic papers is, uh, has been um, in the spotlight recently. The one I'm referring to here is SLM Lab Reinforcement Learning. What, ba what that basically means is you publish your paper in PDF format to whatever journal or conference, but alongside that you have a Jupyter Notebook that goes hand in hand with that, it's sort of a living paper, and you can go through the process so you, do, you can rerun the results from the paper. And that's, that's quite a, um, a shift in, in um, how things are, are working in um, academia. You, you didn't really have this concept before. You, you read a paper and you, weren't, you didn't have access to the data or you didn't have insight into you know, the processes before those pretty plots and um, tables. So a dynamic paper, um, I, I, I'm really looking forward to this concept uh, catching on. Uh, yeah, and the data science workflow and Jupiter, this is where Jupyter excels and uh, especially with the exploratory data analysis, there's lots and lots and lots of different things you can do in a short amount of time and I've uh, linked a YouTube um, playlist from Jake Vanderplas who goes into detail um, in using Jupyter for the entire data science workflow. Often, I mean, it's used in conjunction with pure Python, uh, Python scripting, but going back and forth between Jupyter Notebooks and Python is a worthwhile um, habit to, to form. And he leverages that um, in that series. It's probably no more than a, an hour in total, so worth, uh, worth your lunchtime YouTubing. Um, yeah, okay, so you can see that my, uh, okay, no, you can't see, but my um, toolbar is quite busy, and with Jupyter there comes a lot of um, extensions and magic commands that uh, make your life a lot easier, and that's sort of where you want to um, look to when you want to simplify workflows or if you want to you know do nifty things in and just just a uh, full disclosure this is not a best practices sort of talk this is a look what I found maybe there's a place where you can use it kind of thing okay um, so I obviously data scientists use Jupyter notebooks a lot, especially when it comes to uh, EDA. But the big shift in the progress of uh, Jupyter Notebooks is that it's not just for data scientists. It's been used extensively for teaching and learning. Um, I'll touch a bit on Jupyter Hub later. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with that, but um, using Jupyter Notebooks as a lesson, class lesson, developed by a teacher can be uh, each student can get a copy of this and interactively go through uh, the notebook and 
the, and there can even be automatic grading uh, involved. There are a lot of online courses that uh, use Jupyter Notebooks exclusively. There are even books that have been written in Jupyter Notebooks exclusively. So people are really finding uses for this. Um, yeah, MB Grader is what I just mentioned now. It's a tool for creating and grading assignments uh, in a Jupyter Notebook. It's, it does it uh, automatically for you. And yeah, you can, you obviously, when you're creating assignments and exercises, you generally have it um, going to many people. And uh, there's some good literature out there on it being used on tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of um, individual notebooks on JupyterHub. Um, yeah, data journalists, um, because of this combination of different media types, they have the, the power now with narrative theory and design and lots of public data available uh, to not only show your data provenance, where your data is coming from, how it's processed, how it helps tell your story, very much like a data scientist, um, data journalism has taken off quite uh, quite a bit, and I think we even have some good uh, meetup groups in and around um, Johannesburg. So definitely look out for that if you if you haven't heard of it before. Uh, and obviously, uh, bloggers can take their notebooks and convert them into a blog post, amongst many other things. And yeah, basically anybody who wants to learn something new. So what I found really appealing was that I could open up a Jupyter Notebook, I could get a, a, a video embedded into the notebook of Andrew Ng teaching us deep learning concepts. Um, while, and underneath that have Andrew Ng's paper and have those side by side and also have a link to his GitHub repository and then I can implement what I've just seen in three different formats. And it, I just found it very um, you know, informative. And it just think, how would one approach this same situation without Jupyter Notebooks? It's you know, a, lot of things to, a lot of things to juggle. And I just found this concept quite neat. And uh, it sort of accelerates your, your learning of new concepts. Um, and also your ability to convey new information. Um, if you're trying to get something technical across to non-technical folk, it often helps if you can rely on um, not just you know, dozens of lines of code or, or obscure plots, but have them all together. And it paints a, a story and a picture that helps people who are not familiar with your work to get across. Uh, much quicker. Okay, I probably don't need to mention this too much, but uh, you can. It's platform independent. You can install it um, in if your the main operating systems. Ah, and while you're at it, it's best to install the um, NB extensions. I'm not sure how many people have installed it and use it actively, but just a, a couple of commands and. You will then, on your landing page, have an extra tab called NB Extensions. And maybe I should just show that quickly. So if you, on your landing page, you have these things, clusters and NB Extensions. And there's a bunch of things in here that you could use and leverage. Um, I'm using quite a few of them today. But all, uh, what you want to do is just click on any of them. Um, snippets is quite useful. You click on it, um, and uh, down below it tells you more about it and how to implement it, and whether and you can decide for yourself whether or not you want to use this extension. You can obviously also write your own extensions, um, especially for things that are specific to your your line of work. Uh, it's good to streamline uh, that, that, that process. Um, I'll touch on a few of these a bit later. Uh, okay. What else do we have? 
yeah okay so this is just what a blank uh, notebook looks like again those that are not beginners can just close their eyes for two seconds um, yeah and how to run a cell I'm not going to go through that because I mean it, who's never used Jupyter before ah okay so sorry I've been discriminating against you uh, yeah so you end up with something like this and I think I showed you a bit earlier what the each cell looks like and let's go back to the presentation mode uh, going back with a few okay so basically this is what a new file looks like you know this that's for later in the presentation but you have these cells where you can type in you can see here code you can also type in markdown raw text and um, some headings if you want and you know intersperse them throughout the notebook okay I'm just going to go a bit quicker now all right, I'm just going to touch on some of the functionality in here that I haven't mentioned. Okay. I, I mentioned snippets uh, a bit earlier, so let's show you how they work. Yeah, yeah. all right. Da -da -da. All right, um, if, for those who have used Jupyter Notebooks before, you notice that the theme is very different to the default theme. Uh, the snapshots that I uh, showed earlier is the default theme. And you, you can use custom CSS to create your own theme, um, which I find useful if you're trying to showcase work to clients and you can have like your company logo embedded in the notebook uh, and in the background so it looks more like official, not just some random um, IDE that's that's uh, been shown to them. Um, yeah, so you can do some custom CSS. Uh, I, there you go. Right, you can also embed. So I'm going to get to uh, magic commands now in a bit. I've used them throughout the presentation. Okay, so I just created uh, my own CSS and I put it in this location. You notice I can use these commands by um, just prepending it with an exclamation mark. So that everything's been done inside the notebook. I can even do a pip install from inside the notebook and it'll go where you, where you need it. It's a small caveat there, but it works 99% of the time. Um, snippets. Ah, so you'll notice I have a snippets menu here. Snippets are basically just you know blocks of code that you use often, but you don't want to have to type out each time. Um, and there's a bunch that's prov provided by default uh, for each of these libraries, and you can also create your own. Uh, I just created a quick one called Data Science Imports. Everybody knows before you even know what your problem is, you import pandas, you import numpy, you import map.lib, and instead of typing those lines out, I created a snippet, and um, so if I just create a cell there, go to snippets, and data science imports, and it's there. Obviously, you can do much more uh, you know, functional things with this. If you forget how to write a class, you can have uh, a template for a class in there, or whatever it is. Um, so that's obviously you can see how useful that that would be in your day-to-day -day work. Um, all right, what I like is this thing called um, split view, which allows you to display cells side by side. Jupyter has got some slack because it's very linear in how it works, and you know. It's always one thing below the other, but sometimes you want to compare two things side by side. And uh, yesterday I was at the Hello Types tutorial and doing an exercise, and um, it was very useful to have these things side by side. If you can just find it, so you just do that. Ah. Uh. 
Okay, there you go. So you can see that takes up half of the screen. And then I go to the previous one. And there you go. Now I have these things side by side, which is much better when you're trying to compare things. You can do it with plots as well. So um, nifty, useful, I enjoy it. Um, what else? Okay, then there's just some combining different cells. That's not that interesting. Um, let me just get up with this one. So you can see, um, often you want to, when you're doing data, expl uh, exploratory data analysis, you print out the head or the tail of a data frame. Sometimes you want to look at both. Um, I've done that here. Sorry, I should have used my mouse. But obviously, by default, only the last command gets printed out. So that's the standard behavior, but sometimes you don't want that. And like most things, you can uh, change it to suit your needs. And by running that command, I'm going to print this out. Lo and behold, I have the head and the tail. Uh, so now, now it'll, it'll show you everything that you have in the, in the notebook that you want to display that can get out of hand, so you know, I'm just going to change it back to uh, the last, the last um, cell to show, showcase. Um, before I run out of time, I want to show you, OK. Um, there are some third party libraries that work really nice with uh, Jupyter. Has anybody heard of BKX or used BKX? No, awesome. Um, so if you get a pandas data frame, usually you have you know your rows, your columns, but that's kind of static, and what often what you want to do is, you know, just by looking at the table, have some sort of understanding of what your data is, um, and that will then spur you on to, you know, in the right direction for, for what future analysis to do. So that's actually a bit late in the talk, but let's jump to it anyway. I'll come back to other stuff. So um, everybody probably knows what the data frame looks like, but if I, do I need to import this? Yeah, OK. OK, Seaborn, good visualization library uh, built on top of MapClip. Also comes with data, so that's cool. Uh, so that's just some data about some vehicles, um, and the data frame now looks like this. So that's a bit different to what we expect, what we usually see. Um, sorry, there you go. For one, you can, there's an infinite scroll, so you can look at all of your data seamlessly. Um, usually pandas limits you to whatever you set it, it's default. I'm not sure offhand what it is, but you know you don't get to see all of your data. Um, but better than that, it has this. Um, okay, you won't be able to see it there, but there's these functions where you can like create a heat map for a specific row, I mean specific column, and now you get an, an, a feeling of the displacement. Um, there's also um, heat map. You can get data bars. Okay, that's not that interesting for that column, but it's basically a, a bar to with, that's proportional to the number inside the the cell. Um, you can obviously you can um, sort just by clicking on the table uh, header, which is nifty. You can select a subset of the rows and columns, and the other one is you can color by unique. Um, so you know just by doing this on your data set. Looking at a data frame, you begin to understand a bit better what your data looks like, what you can do with it going forward. Um, there's some other projects, Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Lab. Uh, like I mentioned, one of the sore points of uh, notebooks is that it's very linear. Uh, the, a project called Jupyter Lab uh, aims to address this by maintaining your ability to have different types of formats. You have widgets, plot code, some your documentation, and things on the side. Uh, it's sort of starting to feel like, um, I'm not sure anybody uses RStudio. It has that sort of feel to it. But um, 
So it has all the bells and whistles. With the, you can also add your extensions and your line magics uh, into it. And yeah, that's Jupyter Lab. There's another product called Jupyter Text, which I only found about recently. One of the other sore points of Jupyter Notebooks is that it's notoriously difficult to do proper versioning on it. Jupyter Text, Jupyter Text aims to address this by allowing you to edit a text and your notebook and have them link up um, or have them being synchronized so it's easier to do version control on it. Uh, binder is just something that allows you to give a GitHub repository or just a URL. All the notebooks there are now put inside a Docker container and you can run them regardless of whatever prerequisites um, they were. Um, and just, I didn't touch on the polyglotness of Jupyter, is that you can run many different languages in there. Uh, these are just some of them. I'm running Python 3, you can see here, but I can also, just by doing that, have execute Python 2 code. And I really, one of the, if there's one thing that I want you guys to take away from here is something like this. Uh, yeah, this write, view, run, load, and store. So you can execute Python code, you can execute other Jupyter notebooks within a cell of your own notebook, which, which is useful if you have one notebook that's taking a really long time to, you know, to execute. You can continue with your other work, but instead of serializing your data, you can just uh, store it and access it in a different notebook. So here I stored uh, just a list, and in this unrelated notebook, I just I can run the list that uh, so it just fetches fetches the data. So uh, yeah, I'm probably out of time, but we can discuss any. I haven't done everything in the presentation, but there's lots more untouched. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Ari. Are there questions? So I think that was absolutely amazing. I had no idea the kinds of stuff you could do with Jupiter. It just blew my mind. Oh, so awesome. I'm, I mean, it was almost too much to take in. <laughs> so will you be, um, can I come and get your details and would you please share this with me? Yeah, perfectly fine. No, no problem. It, it'll be on my uh, GitHub, page, uh, GitHub account so I can share it with you and everybody else who's interested. No Thank problem. you. Cool. Thank you very much. Cool. Other questions for Ari? Uh, hi. Um, so I've recently started using Jupyter Lab, and I think it's like a little sexier in terms of interface. Yeah. Um, but how do you feel about Jupyter Lab versus just regular Jupyter Notebook? Well, um, I think in the long term, it's the plan of for the Jupyter developers to completely replace the notebooks with Jupyter Lab. So. I'm definitely heading in that direction. I mean, um, I think it was the beta version that was released, but it's essentially, uh, I mean, stable. Uh, it's a stable version. So um, I agree that um, a lot of the downsides to that linear flow, it can get a bit annoying after a while, and then you have multiple notebooks, you know, and there's just some uh, really cool functionality with JupyterLab. So, if you're new, I'd say jump straight into Jupyter Lab. There's no additional learning curve that I can think of. But um, yeah, Jupyter Lab is probably the future of this project. Yeah. We have time for one more question. By way of incentive, um, we have some prizes to give away for good questions. There's a 100 
dollar voucher for Azure and a couple of t-shirts courtesy of Afro Labs. So I pose again, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Somehow prizes are a great stimulus. Yeah, um, I came in pilots, but then your, your very last comment before the question time was about the right, you know, your, your, your takeaway message. I just want you to say more about that and then you saying that you can run notebook yeah, so if you could just say um, sorry, I didn't. Uh, in, in your closing remarks, you said something about uh, there was this thing you said about write, read something. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. All right. You okay. Just say something small. All right. Um, I think that's worthwhile to touch on again. Um, so maybe it will be a bit easier if I show it to you. Um, so these are what they call uh, magic commands, this double percentage sign. Um, if you have one percentage, it's called a line magic, and that means whatever is in that line will get executed with whatever functionality is, uh, is embedded in that magic command. And a double percentage means it looks at that entire cell and tries to execute that according to what you're trying to do. So um, what you, uh, one of the things you can do is you, if you have some code, it's a Python code, either yours from earlier or one of your colleagues is asking you to look at something that's sort of related to your work. Now, you don't really want to have it live separately because it's sort of related to your work. You can execute it within your notebook by just using this, um, okay, sorry, not that one. Here, here you're actually creating the code. I'll show you the running the code just now. So this is just some standard um, plotting. You write the code, and um, this, all this is now stored in some code.py. Um, and what you can do with that is, firstly, you can have a look at it. And by you, I mean anybody who has access to this runs the same command. You can see a one percentage sign. Line, command, uh, line magic, so you do that, and you, you get to see your code with syntax highlighting in the works. You can, oh, okay, that's what, they, that's what they're doing. Let me, let me run that, let me run that code. And hopefully it works here. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a warning, and yeah, you get your plot. So you can run other notebooks within your notebook. You can run other Python files within your file, uh, within your notebook, and if you have your own workflow process, you know, you do EDA and then the results from that can get piped to your new uh, notebook, especially when your notebooks start getting a bit long. Um, uh, th this is one way of uh, addressing, addressing that. Uh, did that shed more light on? Yeah, okay, cool. Great. Yeah, that was a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So there'll, there'll be a prize for you. And uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.